I'm enjoying my journey. I'm a yeah. dad now of two, and that changed my life a lot. I've always done things for myself, which we all uh-huh. are self-motivated. But now I get to see that that legacy tunnel start to be created where I get to look back to and, and see what my dad did for our family and my mother. And you, you want to emulate that, but at the same time, you want to simultaneously grow within it for yourself as well. So my big motivator has transitioned from a, a self-motivated to let's just see what we can accomplish as a family and as individuals and as a group in collaboration in every aspect, not just financially or, or business. I think collaboration with goal setting is important. And as a husband, as a husband and as a family, I think we need to align goals for everybody. And I think with that comes, unfortunately, until the world changes, is money is a tool. You have to set out to create that tool to do the things that you want to do. And for me, I want to buy my time. I want to make sure I, I do what I want yeah. to do when I want to do it with who I want to do it with. And I want that for my family. So that's pretty much my rocket fuel for my agenda. I'm enjoying my journey. Welcome to the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast. In the Champions Corner edition, I'm Mike Deaton, and together with Lydia, my co host in life, business, and this podcast, we're taking you into the training room, deep in the dojo, sharing the secrets of what it takes to forge a champion. We're digging deep into mindset mastery, high performance habits, best in class behaviors, and bringing you the tips and techniques that maximize human potential, brought to you from some of the best in the business. So grab your buds and your seat. Hit subscribe and get ready to up your game. Let's do the show. Let's do it. Today on the Cashflow Fight Club podcast, we are going in the champion's corner with Chris Angelelo. Chris has a variety of great personal and professional experiences. He lives a rich family-centered life in Boston where he's taken the helm of the family business as the owner-operator of 11 local Duncan franchises. His family also went vertical in their business, buying the real estate, running the operations, and managing the franchise, which has been tantamount to their success. That introduction into the power of real estate, as well as some early multifamily successes with his wife, That prompted Chris to expand his portfolio into residential and commercial investments as well. Chris is now focused on giving back and building his legacy. He's mentoring others in the benefits of multifamily and has aspirations of building up the family business to hopefully share with his young children at the right time. Join us in the Champion's Corner for this insightful discussion with Chris. Chris Angelillo, welcome to the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. We're excited to have you on today. Yes, welcome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate so much having me, and I'm looking to a good battle today. So, yeah, this is more of a far in that. We'll have to come up with a good opponent for you to go up against, maybe a franchise owner. Oh, there you go. See, now we're getting creative. I like that. I like that. It's good stuff. No, I think we're going to have a fun conversation. Like we talked about, a lot of great experience in your background and, and some things that we haven't really necessarily covered, in particular on this one. But maybe before we dive in, give us some background. But who is Chris, and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I appreciate that. So who is Chris? We started out pretty much as a family business. We started our family business. We've been in the Duncan franchise since 89, as I was a little kid. So I grew up in it. It's in my blood. From that point, I went to school, did all that good stuff. And I came out, I was always a super motivated person. And I always had a problem with speed. I like to get into the mix of things and take things apart and and, and see what can come from it. So naturally, I wanted to be in the family business. And it It was an easy streamline for me just growing up in it, naturally coming into the business and learning the other end of it, which you don't get to see growing up. You have your eyes open a little bit in a different way. It was a really nice experience coming into that and having the opportunity to do that and to take over the management end of it was a whole different ball game. And from there came a lot of growth for me personally and for the business. It's been a really awesome ride. Like I said, we just, I was able to take take opportunity and run with it. And I'm excited to see what's next for us in in that next phase. We dabbled into real estate over the way, along the way as well. So that's more of our focus as of today. Yeah, it's been a great ride. I enjoy being a franchisee. It's a day-to-day grind, but like anything else, it's systems and processes and putting the right things into place. But you learn that. It's a healthy transition sometimes from the grind or the hustle and putting your head down and working and then a transition into more of a CEO or 
working to build the business versus being in it. So mm. that's where we are today. That's awesome. So you're a beaner, you're a bean town, right? You're up in Boston? Yes, sir. Uh, that's great. Starting from the beginning, or at least the beginning of your story, what compelled, and I'm assuming it was your parents, but what compelled your parents to get into a Dunkin' franchise? It was actually my father. So my father's uh -huh. the oldest of of three, it was he's a CPA by profession, so it was a collective okay. effort on their part to uh, to figure out. It started off as really as a job for my uncle, and it slowly transitioned into what it is today. We have eleven locations, and I don't think they never, I don't think they ever thought it would be what it is today in terms of the business dynamic. It's cool to hear that story and to see that transition in their life and what it's done for them, and and then obviously create opportunities for us within our family yeah. as well. I'm a generation two, so it's it's nice to carry the baton in a lot of ways, but also find our own growth. And so, yeah, it's been a kind of a cool journey to see a transition and the succession that's come from it and obviously all the opportunities. Yeah, it's been a fun ride. You have siblings? I do, yeah. So I'm the youngest. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. So I get two, I get a brother. <laughs> and a thing, man. I get a brother and two sisters. Yeah, that's that could be another podcast, I think. Are you guys all in the business? We're not, which is funny. I think, I don't know if I'm the only smart one or the only stupid one. But no, at one time we all grew up in it, working in the business when we were younger. It was all, it was always a part-time job for either my siblings or my cousins when we all dabbled in it one way or another. And some of us ran and I guess I stuck around. Maybe I was just the last in line. I don't know. Please, Chris, take the business. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I was blind or what, but uh -huh. no, I'm kidding. But I, I, yeah, I think it's a different mindset. I think, I think the business is a little crazy. You have to, you have to thrive in chaos. I think sometimes, and it's not for everybody. I'm sure you guys see that in your world too. It's some people just like to have a routine and do their thing and just have task orientated professions. And that's fine. It's a different world. And as they say, different strokes for different folks, family businesses, not everybody understands that dynamic. It's a really unique dynamic because it can tear, it can do a lot of damage as well as produce a lot of value. And I think that's sometimes the 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 misconception about family business is mm -hmm. it's not always it's not always great and I I've seen that personally. I was, I'm curious if as a child and then later on young adult did you always know that you wanted to stay in the family business or there was a moment when you decided that you're gonna stay here and you're gonna carry the baton like you said and how was that transition for you? Yeah, it's funny because no one's ever asked me that question, but. Um, a vivid memory comes back now. I remember being in my parents' kitchen when I think it's probably just a product of age where I was in my young 20s. I was coming out of college. Probably we, I was finishing up sports. I always loved sports. I lost interest a little bit. And I remember having the thought of spinning my wheels. And I think that's just a, yeah, a young kid thing where you just don't know what's next. So probably a little bit of fear, a little bit of confusion. And I remember just talking to my dad and he's probably a little aggravated with me, like, what are you going to do? And I was working construction at the time. And I said, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I want to do what you do. And he's like, what do I do? So it was a funny moment because you don't know as a kid, yeah. even as a young kid, it's like you see your parents or maybe someone that you look up to and you know, you want to be them. And as a dad, now I see that, right? Your kids want to be you. I think that's how it started is I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I wanted to emulate or be in that shadow. And I think that's a lot, a lot of times is the ignorance of not knowing and you dive right in, right? You just take action. So <laughs> I think that was, I remember that vividly. Yeah. I remember that just being a very vivid memory. I just want to do what you do and carry your legacy and baton. And probably because it was now that I look back in hindsight, it's probably just because it was an easy it was an easy transition of just how do I answer this? Like, what, what do I need to do? And so, yeah, it's, and since then there's been a lot of learning when I've always been a sponge when it comes to learning, I've always been very interested and contrarian. I want to know how stuff works. When, when I put my mind to something, I just, I, I gravitate and I go right toward it and whatever I start, I typically finish. So I think in that moment, looking back to, I, I didn't know what I wanted per se, but I knew that I needed to do something when that was the next step. And the rest is history. I started from cleaning gum off the bottom of tables to, to, to managing over 200 employees. So it's been, yeah, it's been really fun. How, let's talk a little bit about the franchise life. It's a, it's a topic we haven't touched on and it's one that quite frankly, I'm pretty unfamiliar with. I, I think conceptually, I know what franchises are. You see them everywhere and you hear about them, but I know sure. there are different 
just like any business model, every brand or every company structures their franchise arrangements uh, a little bit differently. I think in the past, you've mentioned how good of a franchise Duncan is, but maybe before getting too much into that, how has it been since, gosh, 80, you're talking a lot of years there, but my understanding of the Duncan brand is in the day, it was it, right? Duncan was the chain. And then there was some turbulence maybe, and I don't know if this was nationwide or whatever, but it seems like the brand fell out of favor and it struggled to find its footing. And then I don't know since when, but maybe 10 years or so, it feels like there's been a, a refresh and a rebranding and a reemergence of Duncan. I don't know if you and your family felt that. No, right, you're hundred uh, percent. Right. Yeah, you're right on the mark. I'll go back. Let's go back to the early nineties. No one really knew what it was when it came from basically a mom and pop type of concept into Dunkin' Donuts. It was more of a Northeast local. And you sit down, you have, you sit down on a stool and have your ceramic cup with a cup of coffee and a donut in the morning for breakfast. But you look back now to where we are today and it is honestly a completely different business. And I think like anything else, like any other business, you go through your growth strains along the way. And we've gone public, we've gone private, we've gone public again, we've gone private again. I think a lot of good leadership along the way got us to where we were. And I think if you look at it more in like segments of where the business was at that time, we've always made the right decisions, not necessarily as a brand for growth, but sometimes just to survive. Yeah. And I think that's part of the understanding to go back to your original kind of question, like not every franchise is the same. And I think today when someone has a really good concept and they want to franchise it, I think the intent is obviously well-intended. It's a good intent in what they want to do. But I think the lag of understanding is sometimes when you take that mom and pop shop or that that private entity, whatever you want to call it, or business, and then you start rolling it out and now you have different operators, right? So you lose the consistency. Sometimes you lose the control aspect of how the business is being run. And, and you got a lot, that and a lot in the profitability and or the survivability of those businesses. And I think Duncan did a really good job along the way. Like I said, we just made the right moves at the right times through leadership, always going head to head with competition, whether it was Starbucks at the time. Locally, we had Honeydew or Heavenly Donuts up in our way. And we always just set out to crush them. It was McDonald's at the time that was trying to get into coffee and they were basically giving it away for free. And my honest opinion is because of the way Duncan is structured on the franchise end of it, it's we're all it's a hundred percent basically franchise e owned. So we are all small business owners. And for us, for instance, like we have eleven locations and we have one in the town that I grew up in. And so people know you, but it really is a small business owner that's running this conglomerate licensed business. And I think that's where the tenacity comes from. I think in our, where, where the inception of that concept started for the Northeast for us, we don't like competition. So we'll set out, to, we'll set out to crush you. And I think that's the mentality that you have when you have people that are growing up in the business. And a lot of our community is generation two, generation three ownership. And we're not just owners, we're managing the business as well. Yeah, I think that's the, yeah. Yeah, that's the dynamic that I think sets us apart, like I said, for survivability. And I think that's a huge part in where we are today and how we got to where we are is that full circle support was or support in leadership where we needed it. But at the end of the day, we're out here in the trenches as owners and small business owners fighting. We're fighting for obviously our own business versus I think sometimes you look at like a McDonald's concept, they're operators, they have a license to operate, but they can't necessarily do much with the business itself. They don't really have a lot of control. With that comes motivation, right? Like how motivated do you want to be to excel sometimes when you have lack of control? So yeah, it's a huge part. It's a very unique dynamic that I think a lot of people don't know about the brand. Tease that out for me a little bit. Like you mentioned comparing other franchises to the amount of control that you have. What's a tangible example of, of something that you guys can implement in your stores or do to be competitive versus maybe some other McDonald's or somebody else would have a limitation? Is there something tangible you can- Yeah, so I think like for us locally, we have, we can leverage the business. It is our business. So we can leverage it in ways that make the most sense for us, whether that's to, mm -hmm. to grow uh, brick and mortar locations or to grow within the community. When you, if for us, you'll see a Duncan sponsoring a little league team and your local Duncans, for instance, I grew up in North Reading, Massachusetts. So it's North Reading, Dunkin' Donuts sponsors little league team. And so we're able to really 
almost have that grassroots type of community aspect that it goes a long way when you don't necessarily see McDonald's sponsoring t-ball games or high schools or local local community type of stuff if you're a local if you're a local mcdonald's uh, owner or something you might have to go through a corporate to uh, get permission to put their brand and their name on a yeah a little team. bit a little bit of red flags on that end of things so it gives us a little bit of breathing room to to be able to do those differentiators or yeah. even starbucks because look at corporations versus franchises was we're able to be that differentiator within the community because we are in the community. We are the community. We're not a corporation or, or a number, numbers or KPI, numbers on a board somewhere. We are the business. And I think that's a huge part for us. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And maybe, I, I don't know if you're able to speak to this, but like for anybody that is interested in looking into franchising, what are some I guess maybe some top two or three things that they should be looking out for when they enter those. I get emails and messages, not all the time, but pretty frequently with, I guess they're brokers. I don't know, but they're yeah. trying to, Hey, I can pair you with a franchise or do something <laughs> like that. What are things that people should be on the lookout for that would either push them away or lean into a certain franchise model? I think track record is everything. And I think that's across life. Look at the history of somebody or a business and what does it tell you? And I think, I think that's a big part of understanding what you're getting into and what they're providing for you. Franchise, and I, I have the same thing. I get messages all the time. I talk to a lot of people too that, that want to be in a franchise or they're thinking about buying one. And it's the same as like real estate. A lot of it, it looks and sounds great. I always ask the first thing is, what are you trying to do with it? Are you trying to buy a job? And if that's the case where I think a lot of times in franchising, a lot of times individuals are buying a job and they're being sold, they're being sold a dream. And sometimes it's just not there, whether it's with vendor contracts, making sure that markets aren't oversaturated with development or they're approving the right development locations. At the end of the day, if you're going to pay someone basically royalties to provide an advantage, I want to know what that advantage is. And I want to know how that separates from other franchises. How are you going to, how are you going to make me compete for a long time? If I'm willing to give the back end, which is I'm managing the business, I'm going to show up every day and make sure that we're doing the right things. I want to know that my, my backside's covered as well in terms of marketing and vendor negotiating development. And so I think that's a big part of it is truly understanding the track record of the franchise, where they're trying to go. A lot of times too, I think the big dream is to go public. It's just to, it's to gain evaluation. So they zip out all these locations and they get all these operators in. And then all of a sudden they're trying to go public and get paid. Yeah. I think that's, like I said, it's like anything else. It's what is the intention of what you're doing, what mm -hmm. you're getting involved with. And the franchises that want to be around for a long time because they're trying to produce a product that consumers want. I think that's where you win. If it's a money orientated transactional, hey, how do we get the highest valuation so we can parachute out and buy my boat? <laughs> I think that's, yeah. I think we're going to have a problem. Yeah, that makes sense. Just a few, picking up on a few things that you said there. So would I be correct in understanding that with Duncan, you have some latitude in terms of the vendors that you use and your negotiations with them versus other franchises, you're locked into whatever corporate comes up and agrees with? Is that? Yeah. So Duncan handles predominantly all of our contractual obligations okay, so uh, and vendors. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's in the best interest of us and they're negotiating pricing and um, in terms, which it, it works because they're working with a mass scale yeah. economy. Yeah. That is fascinating. And for on this business model, I don't watch about it. So it's a naive question, but can you stay with the franchise as long as you want to? Yeah, you can, as long as you're a good operator, I think that's a big important part is. You got to make sure you're a good operator, but yeah, you can stay. Like I said, generate Junkins were generations. It gets passed down through families and depending on your dynamic of management, I think you can last for as long as you like. You can always hire people to, to deal with the operations. Yeah. I think the important part is you want to be with the right franchise for a long time when, but like anything else you can, if people, if people are, are trying to look at it like an investment vehicle and they're trying to put together maybe five, six, 10 locations and then get out of it in five or six or 10 years, more of an investment type of appreciating like vehicle. That's a strategy as well. There's mm -hmm. no, nothing wrong with that. For us, I look at it as it's a vehicle of revenue, steady revenue, mm -hmm. as long as you're managing it. And like I said, we're in it. So we're vertically integrated in that way where we're managing the business. We can use those resources or that leverageability to go out and go do other things, whether it's in real estate. Yeah. So it's a springboard. I, we look at it as a springboard where others, sometimes they just want to get out 
for whatever reason, and that's fine too. And outside of the franchise world, do you mind elaborating a little bit? What other ventures do you have? Yeah. So like along the way, our family got involved in the real estate, specifically in like the locations that our stores were in, just because mm -hmm. we had opportunities that came up to buy. Again, part of our strategy was to make sure that we have control of the asset itself, which gives us a little bit more security in the business end of things. We get to control the cost as well in terms of rent structure. And, and it's a protector to pro of the franchisor. Some franchisors will bowl you right out the front door. The same door you came in, they'll push you right out. Real estate is a big part of, I'll just give you like the trifecta, right? If you can acquire the, the franchise itself or be involved in it, you can manage it and then you can own the property. You're doing very well. It's a, you mm -hmm. Yeah, you control a lot yeah. of the variables in the equation there in terms of and that's your competitive high cost. Yeah, items. and that's like your competitive advantage, not only within the same branded operators, but it's also your competitive advantage with other concepts or competitors. You may have a really good concept, like a local mom and pop coffee shop, and they may get hammered on their lease. And as good as their product is, and as as awesome as their customer base is, they can't survive. And we see that a lot. I'm sure you guys see that a lot too, just when you're stuck in some economic cycles and you can't control those aspects of that, that, that business or that lifestyle, it's, there's nothing you can do from there, from the real estate end of it. Is that how your, is that how your family got into real estate? Kind of your first in was, Hey, let's get control of the commercial struck buildings around where our units are. Yeah. I think that was a big part of the strategy before me was, was to put that in place as a security blanket. Mm -hmm. And from that, just like I said, it was like happenstance. We just happened to be doing these things along the way that came up. And I think from that, like for me personally, I started buying multis, my wife and I in 2011 and very similar. Like we didn't know what we were doing. We just knew that, Hey, listen, we wanted to buy a house. She wanted the single family. And I was like, I don't really want to live in a single family. That's I, I think we should do a multi. When we weren't married at the time, we were dating. So we were trying to figure out the logistics of how's that going to work when we're not married yet. And so she bought a house, I bought a house. And we said, if anything ever happens, at least we have a house, each of us. <laughs> but that was, uh, but I saw that. The point of that was, is I saw that, I guess, advantage being in the business is, mm -hmm. okay, like I, now I know what real estate can actually do. And then the perk of having my father as like a CPA. So he has all the, the tax advantages. So again, a lot of this stuff just happened to be there, like where I was. When being a sponge mm -hmm. and wanting to know what things were or how they how they came about, you start having these conversations like, oh, what is a deduction? And what do you mean the government will let you write off certain things in real estate? And then the wheels turn. Yeah. And, and then you couple that with what you're trying to do. Like at the time we were trying to basically house hack, buy a multi, live in it, have someone mm -hmm. pay the rent. And it's funny because I look back now and it's, I remember the first moment we got our rent check. And I said, this is crazy. This feels like I'm stealing. Um, we paid like $120 toward our mortgage at the time. And I'm like, this is, this is wild. So there's some pretty cool like inflection points for me, like within business and personal life that I'm like, Jesus, I can't believe that this shit is legal. I can't believe yeah. this is, this is real life. And, and then you get addicted. I, you get addicted to that. That, that mentality. And yeah. then you, and then once you start seeking it out, oh man, like you'll never go back. You never go back. Yeah. So to, to get back to like how we came about, it was 2011. I started my, we started our own personal kind of journey within the multi fam space and where we are today, we've, we've definitely accumulated some various asset classes between commercial, residential, mixed use. And it's funny, like another inflection point for us is we tried to do a Duncan development at a property before COVID and it didn't obviously go the way we wanted it to go. But I knew just on my own foundational basis of real estate, I said, we have multiple exit strategies here. If we can't get the Duncan here, mm -hmm. there's definitely an avenue where we can approach the city and potentially get a mixed use development. And long story short, we made the right decisions going in that we were able to basically land bank this thing through COVID and interest only. We work with, again, because we have relationships with the banks and through all these years, healthy balance sheets. A lot of times that's another part of part of the, I guess, the life business that you don't necessarily think of is how, you know, how your track record and what you're doing along the way, yeah. because that moment that you need something like a lender and or a specific scenario, like no one ever thought COVID would ever come, right? That was, yeah. it was like, and not on the, uh, not on the risk matrix of a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like looking back, if you survive COVID at any level, business, personal, like we're good. Like you're doing something well, you're doing something yeah. well. So 
Yeah, so we got into. Yeah, I don't know if you're a uh, Tony Robbins fan or follower, but I do love he, him. Yeah, he has. Yeah, I think he draws on this principle from I can't remember. The, it's a seasonal concept, and he got it from a, a book about seasons and cycles in life. And one of the things he talks about is businesses born out of tough times are tough businesses versus those that get born uh, through easy times. They're softer, and they usually can't make it through the tough businesses. But yeah, COVID forged definitely weeded out a lot of people that were able to pivot and take advantage. And as you mentioned, had the fortune and the wisdom to leverage assets to, to navigate it. And then some others that uh, kind of crumbled, but yeah. It's a yeah. I think that's, I think that's a huge part of, I, and I'm just drawing my own experience, right? This is, it just happens within the last yeah. whatever, four years. But even now, like I'm saying, you know what? I'm so glad, I'm so glad to live through the good and the bad because it does let mm -hmm. you draw in perspective. It does let you slow down a little bit. When, like I said, I remember being a kid and speed was my thing, even in sports, it was, you know, do everything as fast as you can and how, how fast can we grow and scale? And so in moments like that, you look back and say, aha, the wisdom in the room, albeit like our family, and they were doing the right things at the right time. And when you draw on that, now that's wisdom in my bank moving forward. And we're able to use that as a basis to, to make decisions, to move forward too on, on what you do. When not that COVID would ever come up again, hopefully, but I think just the risk analysis of what that is, if you're going to get involved in a development or a business, you really have to think worst case scenario when you really have to mm -hmm. iron out what those exit strategies are. If something does happen when that's a big part of it. Yeah. I'm grateful that we, we can draw on those experiences from a personal aspect. So those are important lessons to learn. And sometimes those are the way we learn them is going through yeah. the 2008 great recession. A lot of people got hammered, COVID, other things. Mentors can also help somewhat, but a lot of times we need to feel the pain to really take the lesson and apply it and go forward and know that, 100%. Hey, as you mentioned, I should have some different exit strategies just in case something happens here or not get overly eager just to land yeah. a deal and maybe be cutting underwriting variables here and there. It's, it's tough, but. Yeah, I think the bias, I think the bias point. too, right? Like your own biases that you sometimes, you, we don't even yeah. know we have until something crazy happens. You go, oh man, like I was not in the right mindset in terms of. Yeah, yeah. Um, not that you anticipate things, but even even being prepared for something even half as bad. So yeah, it's good to draw. Like you said, I think a lot of times we draw on borrowed experience, like from either mm -hmm. mentors or people that you're around at whatever time. So like you, you tend to borrow their experience, which I know I personally have done and I try to learn from it without going through it. But yeah, yeah. I think going through it too is... As long as you survive and come out the other end, it's a very beneficial. Yeah, it really anchors it to definitely in, in your mind, in your mindset. Let's talk mindset a little bit. Yeah, um, let's get into it's it. something we like to talk about on these episodes. What are some standout? Do you have any practices that you use? Any mentors, whether real or I guess you know, they're all real, whether they're personal mentors to you that you're in a personal relationship with or people like I mentioned Tony Robbins or others that you draw from. But how do you stay sharp as an entrepreneur and what do you do to keep that? that sharp mindset. Yeah, I think I think for me along the way I've had people in my life like my father, my, my one of my partners in the franchise who's our director of operations, basically our COO of our operations, Mohammed. He's Moroccan, professional soccer player, came to the United States, so he's the the typical American success story and I love him. And he's a big part of my life from a kid up until today. So you have these people in your life that you don't know, you don't recognize sometimes until later mm -hmm. on and you can draw on that. And I think from that, for me at least, even like in the last five or six years, I've intentionally tried to draw on more of that. And I think sometimes, and that's an age thing, I'll set my life on that. That's definitely an age thing where you know what you don't know and you have to go through yeah. some of these experiences sometimes in life and relationships or whatever. And like you said, you just gotta take the punch off the nose sometimes and, and get humbled. And, and then you start seeking that stuff out. So yeah, to answer your question, um, I love po podcasts that mm -hmm. are pretty relative to what I'm into at the moment, which is like business or real estate. I love the Deal Machine podcast, the Bigger Pockets. I really got into Dan Martell a little bit, buying back your time, which was a really cool concept mm -hmm. for me. And it was super relative to me today is having that bird's eye view now of not being stuck in your business and head down working in the business. And then if you can couple that with the systematized approach of how to scale. And that's what he really hones in on if you listen to him. And he's a super, he's not that guru BS, buy all my stuff. He gives really good values. So I try to steer towards the people that are doing things versus 
sometimes selling things. But yeah, I think mentorship's huge. I love that aspect now. Even for us, I started a mentor program for myself in like a passion project. It's not something that we have uh-huh. to do. It's something that we want to do. Yeah, I saw that recently in a, I don't know, a social post of yours or something. And yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's that's something, it really it hooks on to the question that you just asked is where, how do you feel in terms of mindset of where you are? Mm-hmm. And I think, I just find it fascinating every day, personally, when you wake up and it's almost like when you see the light or you see, you change your mindset to think more positive and try to attract more things versus going after certain things. And then you start to see it actually working. For me, at least that's enough to keep exploring. And I think that's when you're hearing people talk about the law of attraction and what you think you will become and the old who you hang around with is who you are, those types of things. And you go, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, it's just some old timer talking nonsense. <laughs> but like now, now where I am, I'm saying, gee, wow, this stuff is, it seems a little hocus pocus, but I'm like, wow, this stuff, yeah. is, this is, it's working here. And right. that, that was a passion project for me. And I said, I think self-doubt creeps in a little bit sometimes. And I said, I don't know who's going to listen to me and how can I help? And I feel like I'm, I still mm-hmm. need help. And, but that's the point. The point is we're never done learning when I think that's an inflection point that I'm sure I'll look back in 10 years to this point and say it was a good decision because you can always help the person that's right below you. The person that Mm -hmm. has never bought a home before or never started a business. And I think that's part of giving back. And I think that's part of also simultaneously accelerating me when in my career, in my mindset, in my learnings was putting that to practice. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, we rolled out the program specifically on multifamily, multifamily Mm -hmm. mentoring to get people involved and understand the benefits and give them a path that's super custom and super relatable to what they're trying to accomplish. I think that's a big part too of mentorship or coaching today where it's a universal one sleeve fits all. When I think I'm drawing from my own experience and I'm sure it's very similar for both of you where it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot in terms of living a really good, healthy life. When I take that into consideration with the Dan Martell, like buying your time back. And it's that's one thing with all the money in the world you'll never buy is time. Yeah. So when I think that's a big part of, listen, if you can do one simple thing to not only set yourself up to have a good life later on, whether it's whatever you want to do, you want to go sailing, you want to take your kids on vacation. And I think that's part of a lot of our societal depression or anxiety. It's what do I do and how do I do it? And the sad part, everyone's just trying to sell you some junk that, you know, for their own benefit. I think for me, like I said, it's it's near and dear. I just know what it's done for me, for people that were close to me. And it's a way to give back a little bit, my end of it, but also progress my personal brand and and put myself out there and just see what what challenges that I can create for myself to continue to grow. So where is that growth for you these days? What are you looking to do in the next year, two, three years or something? Is it I hate that focused on real estate? Or? <laughs> yeah, I love real estate. I love real estate, waking up and just not knowing what's gonna happen. It sounds funny, but I just love having a different day, different people that you're talking to, putting together deals, puzzles puzzle pieces, just trying to figure it out. Yeah. I'm enjoying my journey. I'm a dad. I'm a yeah. dad now of two and that changed my life a lot. I got a four-year-old and a one-year-old. It Things have changed a little bit. I've always done things for myself, which we all uh-huh. are self-motivated. When, but now I get to see that, that legacy tunnel start to be created where I get to look back to and, and see what my dad did for our family and my mother. And you want to emulate that, but at the same time, you want to simultaneously grow within it for yourself as well. So my big motivator has transitioned from a a self-motivated to let's just see what we can accomplish as a family and as individuals and as a group in collaboration in every aspect, not just financially or, or business. I think collaboration with goal setting is important. When as a husband, as a husband and as a family, I think we need to align goals for everybody. And I think with that comes, unfortunately, until the world changes, is money is a tool. You have to set out to create that tool to do the things that you want to do. And for me, I want to buy my time. I want to make sure I, I do what I want yeah. to do when I want to do it with who I want to do it with. When I want that for my family. So that's pretty much my rocket fuel for my agenda. Great motivator. And us, time will tell. No, that's good. I definitely, a lot of things you're saying ring true. I think it was Stephen Covey, or I can't remember who exactly. We start out infants being 100% dependent on the world to 
make us survive. And then we get a little interdependence where we're needing and, and being our own person. Then we become independent as young adults or whatever. And then we go back to interdependent, but it's nice to see you. I think you're definitely manifesting in many ways through the mentorship program, giving back to your family and setting up legacies, right? You're in a phase of life where, okay, you're in a good, stable situation. You're not fighting to survive every day. You're yeah. able to to think and postulate on how can I give back and how can I leave a legacy and make uh, other people's lives better and say, yeah, that's a great, it's a great general place to be going. And like we've talked about, sometimes you just have to do, right? So you think, okay, let's just start a mentorship program and let's see where this goes, or yeah. uh, let's just stay flexible within the real estate market and see what uh, the opportunities are that are out there. It doesn't have to be exactly 100 unit multifamily syndications are all I'm doing or triple net leasing or whatever. There's so much opportunity that you can take advantage of that it's good to, to I think form part and go after those. Yeah. I think you need a plan. There's no doubt there needs to be like some sort of structure, but sure, yeah, yeah, like you said, I think create your own box. I think there's enough boxes that are always created for us as humans when in society, there's enough boxes that are created for us. And I think to create your own box is obviously a disservice, but I see it a lot. I see it a lot in just conversations with most of our mentees are younger than 30 years old and they're just getting started out or some, some are in their mid forties and it's, they're just coming to the realization that Jesus, yeah, like you said, like I was, I just been concentrating on X, Y, Z and for 12 years and nothing's come to fruition. It's just, and yeah. now they're stuck and it's, it's great. I think Warren Buffett said it, right? It's just figure out where the opportunity is and go all in. And if the opportunity is to do something different, do it. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. to just learn something different. And because it's all, listen, we're all the same. It's fucking scary. I hope I, I, hope yeah. I can swear, but it's, it, it's scary. I've had it. It's, but we're all in that. doesn't matter what level you're at. We all have self-doubt. Even the Elon Musk of the world, I'm sure he sits in his room sometimes and says, well, you know, what am I doing? But it's, yeah, it's, so I think at the end of the day, we're all human and you just got to figure yourself out and you got to be humble in a way that like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask somebody for help, mm -hmm. point blank, or seek that, seek that mentorship or assistance or whatever it is. But yeah, I think that's a big part of, I think you have to understand too, what you don't want. Sometimes people are just stuck in their job. And unfortunately too, like society changes very quick economically too. I think we were talking about retirement last week about what that term is and how it just is like that safeguard. Oh, we're working for retirement. <laughs> when you were working at the factory at one time, shuffling bags yeah. on the back wall. Yeah. Like that was the only option. And I think today, like you said, you got to get out of your own box and, and tunnel sometimes and say, it's okay to have multiple streams or multiple things going on that are, that are driving opportunity. And I think that's a big part of today is not only not knowing, but then you add the element of distraction, which is your phone, social media, and it's forget it. It's, it, it could be a mountain to climb for some people. Yeah, it's hard. I, we have young adult daughters, so in their 20s, just getting started. And what you mentioned about learning what you don't want, that's a big part of it, right? You get out and you get a job at a restaurant or something. And you're like, oh, yeah, I do not want to be doing this for the rest of my life. And so I need to leverage my skills and get a better job. Or I don't want to be living paycheck to paycheck every month. I, I need to figure out how to get some breathing room. All those things are equally as important because a lot of times we don't know. I never really knew, okay, what I wanted. I didn't have this targeted path. It sounds like you and I come from a bit of a different, a, a bit of a similar background in that I ran operations and supply chain for decades. And while there is, I, I find comfort in some level of framework and systems and things that are happening every day is different, right? There's a snag over here. There's a crisis over here. And so it's about problem solving, getting in, doing things, but you're doing that within some structure as well, right? You're able to look at things, but there is a lot of variety within that. Uh, it's, I, just I, a I, comment, right? What's funny is, and, and I think that's a huge advantage, like similar to me is when you wake up and you just know something's going to go wrong today, or mm -hmm. something's just not going to go the way you think it's going to go. That literally prepares you for life. And I look back now yeah. and say, I'm so glad that I didn't have such a regimented structure where like nothing fluctuated mm -hmm. because then it's if the smallest thing, like if the ball rolls off the shelf, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? I got to sell the place. But, but yeah, I think that's part of, if I were to give like my kids, my two cents, go work, yeah. go work for someone that you'd never want to work for again to feel that. And I think sometimes too, even as a dad, you, when, as a parent, you give that super regimented structure of, and a kid goes to college and they fly off the handle. I think there's a healthy balance to, I guess, a controlled exposure to, to certain things and it's healthy. 
And I love, I'm sure same for you. Like I love, you know, that gets me moving, but I know what it does. I do, on the back end, I know what it's done for me. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. Let's maybe bring this full circle. And we like to close out our shows with gratitude. I know there's been a lot of touch points in your life and people that I'm sure have touched you, but any one or two standouts that you'd like to just express a bit of gratitude for getting you where you are today? Yeah, I think for me, I think my family as a whole, I think my wife, mm -hmm. my, my mom and my dad, my parents and my wife, for the most part, my parents for mm -hmm. dealing with me as a kid. I wasn't the easy, the easiest child. I was a typical boy, but they stuck with me and, and I'm thankful for them for sacrificing, giving, giving up a part of their life to, to plug a future for their kids. And, and then my wife, same thing. She put up what she puts up with a lot. I always, t I, I joke with her. I always say I would never marry me. So I give her a lot of credit, but we're very similar in that way. We're open and honest and we realize nothing's perfect and everything is work. At the end of the day, just make sure that we work through it and work at it. And so, yeah, I'd say my parents and my wife is what I'm grateful for. Love that. It's yeah. Beautiful. Are your parents still involved in the businesses or are they? It's dad? funny. So my mother retired like literally when she was 48 from, she worked for a housing authority, uh, a local housing authority as like a director. And then she came okay. in and worked at my family's CPA practice as she does like some admin bookkeeping and she does all the records and stuff mm -hmm. for us. So they will never go anywhere. My dad is still here. He does what he does and I love him. Don't get me wrong, but he'll never hang it up. I'm the same yeah. way. I'll probably die in my chair, but, but that's what I love. I love the fact that they love what they do and, and they have the motivation to, to keep on going. And yeah, I love that. But yeah, they're, they're still around. They're, they're doing their thing. So it's all good. Big, big family unit there. Uh, I like, I love that. It's funny because yeah. during the holidays, we don't really talk a lot because everything that we already need to say <laughs> has been said Monday through Friday. So, okay. Yeah. That. We didn't get into the details, but I'm very fascinated by, by people that can make family business successful. And we, Mike and I work together and we have people asking us, how do you do it? it it's is. it's not okay. always easy, but. Hey, you're still together. I have a cousin. That's a testament, that, uh, that's a testament of success. Right? It is really. Yeah. It's a personality thing to begin with, especially with us. We have a great personal relationship that we can build upon to leverage into our business relationship. Not always the case with family businesses, because sometimes mm -hmm. it's a forced, forced interaction and you deal with conflicting personalities and it, it can be chaotic. And I, you touched on it earlier in the podcast, but yeah, it is a very impressive thing. A cousin that her husband has a, a very successful, large company and it's a family business. And so he has children that are all in it and their spouses and he makes it work. Right. They, they respect one another. They respect authority and hierarchy and do their thing. And I'm always impressed when I hear the stories and I'm sure there's dysfunction <laughs> beneath the surface, right? But they make it work yeah. and he doesn't take any bullshit and he makes yeah. sure that, Hey, work is work and you're going to do the work or you're not going to work here or, or, but family's family. And so it all works, but yeah, I'm always somewhat amazed when it works about, and I fantasize a little bit about having our daughters in our business and yeah. some things, but then I think sometimes, man, I that want just, that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, but, yeah, I, it is. yeah, I, I love the fact that you guys, my wife's a nurse, but I think we have, when we go home too, it's, we'll have those conversations. It's just, she doesn't understand because she's not in my world and vice versa. It's, I'm always like, okay, just put the laptop down. So I can't do that. But yeah, it's a health, like you said, it's a healthy balance, but I love the fact that you guys can work together and that's a big part of the family businesses is how do you stay energized for like conversation and because mm. you're together all day. So like when you go home, yeah. it's a funny dynamic because sometimes it's okay to go home and just be silent, like just right. go read a book or whatever. Legia goes on, you go swimming and you go read a book. Or it's okay yeah. to have deviation because it's healthy. I think, yeah. like you said, if you're on the same page and the, your spouse understands the give and take, like you said, it's never perfect. And as long as you're arguing behind closed doors that no one else can see, I think that's the, that's the healthy part, but yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad I envision my kids too. That's a big part for me is it's just a, yeah. a, it's just a cool, it's a cool dynamic, but at the same time, you don't want to pressure them either. You don't want to pressure them right. to like not be them. So you're going to be off and fly the world and let them do it. But yeah, it's cool. It's, Family's fun, man. I think it's just the unknown of what can possibly come up today. And, but and after some time that you're going to be able to handle it most likely, right? It's okay. We've been through the battles. 
something comes up, we know we can rally together and, and exactly. make it happen. And yeah, I think um, on the flip side too is so much- when something bad happens or there's a little bit of a little bit of strain. I think sometimes what holds the business together itself is the family, knowing it's blood. So we don't know what we're going to do at this point, but we yeah. are family, so we're just going to move forward as a unit. We may not talk to each other, but we're going to move forward as a unit, and and we'll come out the other side. So I think there's a little right. bit of safeguard in that too. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, it's all good, man. We appreciate you coming on the show and sharing a little bit of wisdom and yeah, great variety of topics here. I, I love the the path that you've come from and just the family ties and family business, but also being allowed to spread your wings and explore other things. And now you're, you seem to be in the captain's chair a little bit, just uh, charting your course yeah. and all that. But yeah, we really appreciate the time and I love, love your journey and let's stay in touch for sure. Yes. Yeah, same. I appreciate both of you guys. It's been really fun and I'm sure we'll see each other on, on LinkedIn and we'll have some fun conversations. So no, I really appreciate oh. today. It's been awesome to get to know you. And for the people that are interested in your program and want to hear more about what you do, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best ways on LinkedIn or Instagram at Chris Angel Willow. Link my LinkedIn is Christopher Angel Willow, A N G I O L I L O. And yeah, I'm always here and accessible. So I enjoy the I enjoy the connections. Right on. We'll get that in the show notes so anybody that's interested can find you in those places. And uh, wish you nothing but the best, man. Yeah, same here, guys. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. For those of you joining us today, we hope you enjoyed this time in the Champion's Corner as much as we did. Got some awesome takeaways, and most importantly, we'll take action to continue living your best life and maximizing your potential. Mindset is such an important aspect of life, and when coupled with action, delivers undeniably powerful results. Please subscribe to the podcast to hear from more great guests and get the latest mindset mastery insights and cash flow matchups. Again, thank you so much for investing your time with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast. <laughs>